Hi guys, my name is Jack, and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. The case of Kelsey Smith. Went shopping for a gift and vanished without a trace. How often do laws enacted at the state level, or the rules and policies of individual companies designed to protect people and make their lives more comfortable and safe, end up causing harm rather than good? In today's story, a mobile phone operator refused to provide the location of a missing girl, citing privacy laws. In reality, however, the company was obstructing the investigation, delaying the process. Although, tragically, it was too late to assist the girl, in other cases, timely access to such data could save someone's life. The case of young Kelsey Smith, who was tragically killed just a month after celebrating her 18th birthday, not only shook the United States but also captured the attention of the world, as it was widely reported in international media. The girl was abducted in broad daylight from a crowded location, and her body, bearing signs of violence, was later discovered outside the city. The search for Kelsey took almost a week due to the inability to track her movements through her cell phone signal. This circumstance led to much debate and set a precedent that resulted in a series of amendments and the passage of a law named after the victim. But let's look at Kelsey Smith's story from the beginning and try to understand how she was abducted right outside a shopping center, under the watch of dozens of surveillance cameras, and whether this tragedy could have been avoided. We will also explore the personality of the abductor and criminal, who was considered by all to be a loving husband and caring father. Who is Edwin Hall? We will begin our examination of this difficult case by getting to know the man who caused the terrible tragedy. Edwin Roy Hall, friends knew him as Jack Hall, was born in 1981, April 17th, in the small town of Lee's Summit, located almost on the border of the states of Missouri and Kansas. He was the second child in a low-income and extremely disadvantaged family. Edwin's childhood was hard, if not to say harsh. Parents of the boy used in large quantities of hot drinks and illegal substances, not engaged in the upbringing of children and mistreated them. Later, Hall will tell about the fact that at the age of five, he was intimately abused by his uncle, his father's brother, but unequivocally confirm or deny this statement is simply not possible. Many thought that this detail was invented by the perpetrator's lawyer in order to make his client look like a victim of circumstances at the trial and try to mitigate his punishment. But be that as it may, and at the age of six, Edwin found himself in an orphanage after his father was behind bars and his mother was deprived of parental rights. In the following years, the boy changed several foster families, but each time he was abandoned after a while and returned back to the orphanage. This was due to the uncontrolled aggression of the child, as well as his cruelty. From an early age, Hall showed sadistic tendencies towards animals. He liked to torture them and watch the suffering. The boy did not recognize anyone's authority, disobeyed his foster parents, stole, and ran away from home. His last foster family returned Edwin to state custody at the age of 15. This was after the teenager attacked his stepsister with a knife. Then the tragedy was avoided and the boy was pitied and not prosecuted. However, a year later, he again came to the attention of the police when he deliberately hit another orphanage pupil, who was much younger than him, on the head with a baseball bat. As an adult, Hall had no record with the police and he seemed to have matured, taken charge, and finally reformed. At the age of 20, he married a girl named Alita, who bore him a son a year and a half later. Edwin got an old Chevrolet truck from the 70s, on which he worked, transporting various goods. His neighbors knew him as a quiet, humble, and friendly guy, as well as a good family man. However, he also had another secret life, which became known only when Hall found himself in the dock for committing serious crimes. Who was the victim? Kelsey Smith. Kelsey Ann Smith was born in 1989 on May 3rd in a place called Overland Park, which ranks as the second most populous city in the state of Kansas. She was the third of five children in the large and very close-knit family of Gregory and Missy Smith. Growing up alongside her older brother Steve and sister Lindsay, as well as her younger siblings Caddy and Zach, she was very close to all of them. 
The family patriarch, Gregory Greg Smith, was a former military man and a veteran of the United States Navy. He had also served in the police force for over two decades and was now enjoying his well-deserved retirement. Meanwhile, the mother, Missy Smith, had dedicated her life to health care, having worked for many years at one of the local hospitals. Despite her professional commitments, she brilliantly managed to balance work with raising her numerous offspring and creating a cozy home environment. From a young age, Kelsey was an extremely active, sociable, and theatrical child. She loved to sing and dance, attended a music school where she learned to play several musical instruments, and eagerly participated in school theater productions and choir performances. In addition to this, she thoroughly enjoyed gymnastics and loved soccer, often attending various sporting events with her father and brothers, and she was a fan of the local team. Young Smith had many friends, possessed a great sense of humor, was talented in numerous areas, and knew how to make a good impression on those around her. She also had a profound love for animals from childhood and dreamed of going to college after high school to pursue a career as a veterinarian. In her senior years of high school, Kelsey took a job in the local orchestra, where she played the clarinet, performing at various city events. This job allowed her to save enough money in just six months to buy her first personal car, a 1987 Buick Regal. Her parents weren't too fond of the fact that her car was older than she was and offered to add some money from the family budget to buy something more recent. However, it was crucial for her to purchase her first vehicle independently with her own money, so she declined their offer. Kelsey's Personal Life It's noteworthy that the Smiths went to great lengths to provide their children with the very best, caring deeply for their education and holistic development. However, they also raised their offspring with a strong sense of discipline. There were clear rules in their home that everyone abided by without exception. For instance, all family members were expected to share their plans and always inform each other if they were going to be out late. Kelsey herself was always punctual, never late, and would always tell her parents where she was going and who she was spending time with. See, during her senior year, Kelsey entered into a romantic relationship with a young man named John Beersmith. According to Kelsey, it was a deep and mutual love at first sight, the kind you read about in books or see in movies. The couple rang in the new year of 2007 together and from then on were practically inseparable. Smith's partner, a year her senior, appeared to be a serious young man who treated his beloved with the utmost care and respect. Both sets of parents approved of their children's choice and did not stand in the way of their relationship. In May 2007, Kelsey celebrated her 18th birthday. That same month, she graduated from high school and was thrilled to learn that she had been accepted into a prestigious college in Kansas, where she intended to study veterinary medicine. The following days were, without exaggeration, some of the happiest in the young woman's life. Unfortunately, they turned out to be her last. Smith, along with her classmates, attended parties celebrating the end of high school. She had a great time, fully enjoying the festive atmosphere as well as romantic dates with her beloved. At this point, she had achieved everything she had wished for. Admission into her dream college, a relationship with a worthy young man who was about to propose, and it seemed a long, happy life lay ahead of her. The Disappearance from the Mall Parking Lot On June 2, 2007, Kelsey and John were preparing to celebrate a significant milestone in their relationship, the six-month anniversary of when they first started dating. John planned to make the day even more memorable by proposing to Kelsey. He had a beautiful engagement ring custom-made for the occasion, reserved a table for two at a restaurant, and the evening was set to be one of the happiest in their lives together. Kelsey was unaware of the upcoming proposal, which was meant to be a surprise. She, too, was looking for a gift to surprise and delight John. That Saturday, she styled her hair, did her makeup, dressed up, and drove her car to a Target Corporation store located just ten minutes from her home. There was no indication of the tragedy that was about to unfold. Around seven in the evening, she called her mother to say she had found a gift for John, but needed to find the perfect gift bag for it, preferably something with a romantic touch. 
Missy suggested checking a shopping mall across the street from Target, confident that it would have what Kelsey was looking for. Kelsey thanked her mother for the advice and said she would be home soon, where John was supposed to pick her up at 8 o'clock. That was the last time Missy heard her daughter's voice. Kelsey never made it back home. When John arrived at 8 with a large bouquet of flowers, he was shocked and frightened to find that Kelsey was not there. Her parents were equally terrified, as it was completely out of character for her not to answer phone calls or texts. She vanished in broad daylight, in a busy area, and no one noticed her disappearance. Search and Investigation The family patriarch, along with his two eldest children, set out to search for their daughter. Upon finding her car parked at the Oak Park Mall, a sliver of hope emerged that Kelsey might still be inside the mall for some unknown reason. However, after searching through all the floors and stores and inquiring with the salespeople and security guards if anyone had seen the girl, they were convinced she was not there. Returning to the car, which appeared undisturbed without any signs of struggle or violence, the father, leveraging his experience as a former police officer, decided not to touch anything. It was possible the car was part of a crime scene, and it was crucial not to tamper with or destroy any evidence. The girl's parents reported her missing to the police that same day, but were initially met with resistance to start an immediate search. The explanation was that since Kelsey was 18, she wouldn't legally be considered missing until 24 hours had passed since her disappearance. However, Kelsey's father, not one to back down and using his old connections, insisted on an immediate search for his daughter. Moreover, he made inquiries to see if any hospitals in the city had admitted women matching their daughter's description. Kelsey's family and fiancé were interviewed that same evening to establish their alibis and rule them out as suspects, a standard procedure. Surveillance footage from the Target store was also reviewed. The videos showed Kelsey entering the store, browsing the selection, making a purchase, and then, while talking on the phone, leaving the building to head back to her car. At that moment, she was speaking with her mother, asking where to find a gift bag, and then headed to the mall across the street, following her mother's advice. Essentially, Kelsey simply drove out, turned around, and parked at the Oak Park Mall, leaving her car near the side entrance almost against the wall. Her car was thoroughly inspected by experts. It seemed untouched from the outside. The gift she bought for John was on the passenger seat, and her backpack with personal items, a tablet, and a wallet containing about $300 in cash was in the back. Therefore, a robbery was quickly ruled out. It appeared that the car's owner had left only with her credit card and phone in her pocket, as everything else remained inside the car. No signs of a struggle, blood, or damage were found. There were no foreign fingerprints except for one found on the driver's seatbelt. This fingerprint belonged to neither Kelsey, her relatives, nor her boyfriend. Issues with the cellular company tracking the young woman's location could have been possible through the signal of her mobile phone. By that time, the device itself had become inaccessible, presumably turned off or damaged, but it was still feasible to determine the last known location where the mobile phone was active in order to narrow down the search area. However, Verizon Communications, the wireless carrier, did not provide the necessary data for the investigation for several days. Interestingly, the company did not outright refuse to cooperate, but kept promising to look into the matter, effectively dragging out the process. Back in 2007, telecommunications companies were allowed to withhold subscriber data from law enforcement agencies, including the police or FBI, without a specific court order. They cited information privacy laws and even situations where an individual's safety or life might be at risk were not considered exceptions to this rule. The Disturbing Stranger Upon closer examination of the surveillance footage, a chilling detail was uncovered. A mysterious stranger following the young woman like a shadow. He didn't stand out at first because he always kept his distance and didn't attempt to interact with Kelsey directly. The individual in question was a Caucasian male with a pleasant appearance, estimated to be in his early to mid-twenties, sporting dark, short hair and a light beard. He was dressed casually in a plain white t-shirt 
and black shorts. He entered the Target store roughly half a minute after the girl and followed her through all the sections she visited, maintaining a few meters distance. This mysterious man was captured by all the surveillance cameras that Kelsey was, and later during the trial, the prosecution would describe his behavior as akin to a predator stalking its prey. He exited the store after her and, making sure she was alone, followed her to the Oak Park parking lot in his Chevrolet truck. It's likely that he overheard her conversation with her mother, as he was practically behind Kelsey while she was on the phone. Consequently, he could have learned about her plans to visit the neighboring shopping center. Unfortunately, Smith parked her car in a poorly chosen spot next to a side door near a storage area where shadows fell on her vehicle, making it nearly impossible to discern the events on the camera footage. While Kelsey was still seated in her car, the truck parked beside her, and a figure in a white t-shirt and black shorts emerged. The stranger approached her from the driver's side door, and then she, presumably under the threat of harm, got behind the wheel of his Chevrolet, and the truck drove off in an unknown direction. Media Attention and Alert Viewers From the outset, largely thanks to the connections and experience of Gregory Smith, the media were enlisted to cover the investigation. Smith knew that the louder the outcry, the broader the coverage in the press, and the more attention it garnered, the higher the chances of finding their daughter and bringing the responsible party to justice. The story was covered not only in national, but also in international media, including on the popular show America's Most Wanted. When surveillance footage revealed the mysterious stranger following Kelsey, the frames showing his face most clearly were broadcasted in the news, urging people to come forward if they recognized the man. That same evening, the police began receiving calls from individuals claiming to have seen the man in various cities and even states. Although most of these reports were mistaken, each one was investigated. On June 6th, a Mrs. Miguez called in, stating she recognized her neighbor Edwin Hall in the footage but had hesitated to report it initially due to doubt. However, seeing the information about the truck removed her last doubts, as Hall also drove an old 1970s Chevrolet. Horrific discovery at Longview Lake and suspects arrest. On June 6, 2007, several pivotal events unfolded in the investigation. First, crucial data regarding the last known location of Kelsey's phone signal was finally obtained from Verizon Communications. A specific cell tower was pinpointed, establishing a search radius of 1.1 miles to the north of it. Within 45 minutes of initiating the search operation, the lifeless body of the young woman was found in the brush near Longview Lake, Missouri, approximately 30 miles from where she was abducted. The medical examiners determined that Kelsey had been brutally assaulted and then strangled with her own belt. Her body was discovered without clothing, except for the belt used to strangle her around her neck. After the assault, her body was callously discarded in the bushes, covered only slightly with dry branches. Over the four days it lay exposed under the June sun, her remains were severely disfigured by insects and other wildlife, making them almost unrecognizable. Nonetheless, the examination confirmed that it was indeed the missing young Smith. The second significant event on June 6th was the arrest of the main suspect. When the police arrived at the man's residence, he was completely calm, acknowledged that his friends called him Jack, and agreed to provide a statement at the station. During the interrogation, he identified himself as Edwin Hall. Presented with a photograph of Kelsey, he claimed never to have seen her before. Even when shown surveillance footage from the store showing him following her closely, he insisted he had merely visited Target for personal reasons and hadn't noticed her, suggesting their appearance together in the footage was merely a bizarre coincidence. Irrefutable evidence. Edwin was evidently confident that he had left no trace behind and could not be held accountable. His van was clean. He had assaulted the victim using contraception, leaving no DNA evidence. Therefore, Hall agreed to cooperate with the investigation and even volunteered to provide his DNA sample and fingerprints. Crucially, his thumbprint matched the one found on the victim's car's seatbelt buckle, becoming a pivotal piece of evidence. Furthermore, during a thorough search of the suspect's home, 
a hidden air pistol was found with Kelsey's DNA traces on the barrel. Hall was then officially charged with the abduction, assault, and termination of the young woman's life. Since Smith was abducted in Kansas, but her lifeless body was discovered in Missouri, there arose a question regarding the jurisdiction of the trial. This detail was significantly important as it affected the potential sentence. In Missouri, the perpetrator faced the possibility of capital punishment. Trial and sentence Hall, realizing the gravity of his situation and after consulting with his attorney, decided to fully admit his guilt and disclose the details and circumstances of the crime in hopes of receiving a lesser sentence. He recounted how he noticed Kelsey as she entered the store and followed her. Indeed, he was close enough to overhear her phone conversation, learning she planned to visit the shopping center across the street. Edwin made sure Smith was alone, followed her to the adjacent parking lot, and was pleased when she parked in a secluded spot near the side entrance. He then emerged from his vehicle, armed with a pistol, waited for the victim to return to her car, and prevented her from closing the door as she was getting into the driver's seat. Apparently, she had already pulled out the seatbelt, but he didn't allow her to buckle up, leaving his print on it in the process. Next, he placed the pistol barrel in the unfortunate girl's mouth, coercing her to move to his vehicle's driver's seat under threat. Smith drove Hall's truck while he aimed the weapon at her and instructed where to go. Upon reaching a remote area at the state border, he ordered her out of the truck and led her into the bushes. There, he assaulted her, strangled her with the belt, and covered her body with branches. He meticulously cleaned his truck's cabin to remove any fingerprints, DNA, or other traces of the victim's presence, and hid the pistol with Kelsey's saliva at his home, confident it would never be found. When asked about his motive, he couldn't provide a clear explanation, but indifferently commented on her fantastic legs. Additionally, during the investigation, several other women and girls victimized by Hall's actions came forward. It was revealed that he had coerced a 14-year-old neighbor into intimacy with threats, harassed a local waitress, and fled a restaurant without paying. As a result, charges of corruption of a minor, harassment, and theft were added to the existing accusations. Hall's lawyer attempted to appeal to the court's sympathy, highlighting his client's troubled childhood, past victimhood, lack of parental care, and upbringing in foster homes. The defense's efforts were in vain, but the lawyer was the only person to speak on the defendant's behalf and support him. Hall's wife was present at all court hearings, but sat quietly in a corner, refusing to defend her husband. On September 16, 2008, Johnson County's judge sentenced Edwin Roy Hall to 27 life sentences without the possibility of parole. After hearing the verdict, the defendant apologized to the Smith family for his actions and then broke down in tears. He is currently serving his sentence at the Hutchinson Correctional Facility in Kansas. The Kelsey Smith Act The role of Verizon Communications in this case which hesitated for four days to provide data regarding the last known location of the missing girl's phone signal, drew significant attention. The company's leadership cited privacy laws and the absence of a court order, the issuance of which would take time. Although it was later determined that this information wouldn't have saved young Smith, in other situations, it could help preserve the lives and health of individuals in danger. This led to the enactment of the Kelsey Smith Act by Kansas in 2009, mandating telecommunications companies to provide subscriber location information when there is a risk of death or serious physical harm to the individual. An additional 29 states, including Missouri by 2012, adopted similar legislation. In 2021, Oklahoma, Montana, and Illinois also passed the Kelsey Smith Act. Since its enactment, this law has helped save many lives. For instance, in 2015 in Lenexa, Kansas, when a perpetrator stole a car with a child in a car seat, the police were able to locate him within half an hour by tracking the signal from the mobile phone left on the back seat by the child's mother. In 2021 in Illinois, a similar method was used to find a young woman who attempted to end her life by jumping off a cliff. She survived, albeit with significant injuries, but the prompt tracking of her phone signal led to her rescue. Interestingly, 
The Smith family never requested the law to be named after their deceased daughter. The idea came from Kansas Senator Rob Olson. Following their tragedy, the girl's family established a foundation to assist crime victims and continues to raise awareness among young people about safety issues. Thanks for watching, guys. That was Jack with you. Subscribe to the channel. There are many shocking stories ahead.